I want you to turn with me now, please, to the 16th chapter of Luke's Gospel. Luke's Gospel this morning, chapter 16. And I want you to come with me, please, to verse 19. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 16. And down, please, to verse 19. And the Lord Jesus is speaking. And he says in verse 19, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. I want to make one thing absolutely clear before I go any further. This is not a parable. What the Lord Jesus is saying really happened. Many men comment on the fact that this was nothing more than a parable. I don't believe a word of it. I believe what we're about to read was total fact. These were two real men. And throughout the four Gospels, if you read, it's always made known that when the Lord Jesus was speaking in parables, it was always identified as a parable. This is no parable. This happened. This really happened. And there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and saith Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send them to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And we know that the Lord will add his blessing to the reading, again of his own and precious and inspired truth. This portion of Scripture, child of God, is often referred to, is often turned to, as far as gospel preaching is concerned. It's a, certainly a, a solemn portion of Scripture that warns the sinner that warns those that are in their sin of the eternal fate that lays before them. My dear unsafe friend, I want to take a wee moment just before I go any further. I want you to realize something this morning, that hell is a real place. The man in hell was a real man. This man this morning was a man that 
that lived under the same sun that we live, who breathed in the same air that we breathe, who walked the same earth as we walked. And this man this morning in Luke 16, my dear unsafe friend, he breathed in the same air that you're breathing this morning. He was a man who lived a life as you live. And my friend, I have to warn you this morning, listen to me. Hell this morning's a real place. It's a factual place. It's a place this morning, child of God, where the fire is not quenched and where their worm dieth not. And this very morning, child of our unsafe friend, listen to me. This very morning, I want you to pause. And I want you to ponder. And I want you to think that if this was to be the day of your death, will you be in hell? My friend, if this was the day you're today, if this was the day you breathed your last, if this was the day it was all to be over, listen, ask yourself the question, man, where will your soul be? This is real. And my friend, to die without Christ and to die without the Savior, friend, it's absent from the body, but it's in the burnings of hell. But it hasn't to be that way. Because at this very moment, I want to tell you of my lovely Savior. Unsaved man, unsaved woman in this meeting this morning, I want to tell you there's one who suffered and bled and died on Calvary's cross to see you saved. To see you stop from going to this awful place called hell. Friend, Christ believed it was real. And because he believed it was real, that's why he went to the cross. That's why he died the awful, atoning death that he died. So listen, man, that you could be saved. Is that not music to your ears? That Christ on Calvary's cross died to save you, to die to stop you from going to hell. Because I want to tell you, my friend, my blessed Savior died to save you. Do you want to know something else about my lovely Savior? He's actually here this morning, and perhaps He speaks to you right now. And my friend, you need to trust Him this morning. You need to trust Him before it's too late. Do you know what Hebrews 9, 27 says? It's appointed unto men once today. None of us in this meeting is guaranteed the three score years and ten. And my friend... Hell's a real place. But Christ is the Savior of sinners. Can I plead with you, unsaved friend, this morning to come and trust the Savior? The one who wants to save, the one who wants to forgive, and the one this morning that wants to set you free, come to Him this morning. Can I plead with you? And trust Him, who alone can and must save. Oh, be warned, unsaved man, unsaved woman, hell is a real place, but Christ saves, and He can save this morning. What does God want to say to us this morning, child of God? As far as ministry, 
to your heart. And as far as ministry to my heart is concerned, from such a portion like this, what does God want you to do? What does God want me to do as we come to this solemn portion? You know what God wants us all to do this morning, child of God? He wants you and I to listen. And He wants us to learn from the lost. Child of God, God wants you and I this morning to listen. And He wants us to learn from the lost soul in hell. Now you listen carefully to hear. You can hear in this passage clearly the lost man's cry. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. And seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried. The lost man's cry, child of God. Man, we can learn much from the lost man's cry. It was William Booth, I think it was. I know George Mueller also said it. What we need is God to take the whole lot of us and to lift the lid of hell and to let us hear for five minutes the screaming of immortal souls being tormented in hell. I say, child of God, if you and I could only hear the reality of the screams of lost souls in hell. Mueller said, we would never be the same again. Oh, child of God, if you and I could be brought to the mouth of hell and made listen to the screams of immortal souls as they're being tormented, I'm telling you, it would make us preach more eagerly. And it would make us pray more earnestly. And child of God, the need for today and the need for the hour is the sound of a lost man's cry. The sound of a soul tormented in hell. Oh, child of God, it would awaken us, would it not? I'll tell you, it would make men in pulpits sit up and stand up and preach up. If only every man who occupied a pulpit heard the screams of souls tormented, they wouldn't be watering their messages down. And they wouldn't be worrying about their salary. And they wouldn't be worrying about their congregation. What I think. Oh, child of God, this is real this morning. This is real. Oh, child of God, listen to me. Dare we fall asleep this morning, child of God, to those that are perishing around us. How tragic, child of God, how terrible. If we can go on this morning and live life to the full and have no thought for those that perish around us. The lost man's cry.
Now you listen to the lost man's cry to you here. It may be the cry of your mother someday. Do you hear me? It may be the cry of your old mother someday. It may be the very cry of your child, love. Your grandchild. And as you listen to the cry of the lost soul this morning, listen to me. This could be the cry of your grandchild. Oh, child of God, let's listen and learn this morning from the lost man's cry. Friend, it's not this man's cried the moment he died. He lifted his eyes in hell and listen to me, he's still crying. His torment has an ease, child of God. And there are souls this morning of your family circle. There are souls of your neighbors. There are souls of your ma uh, fellow man. Listen to me. This will be their cry. Oh, listen to the lost man's cry and learn. Learn that it's real. I am tormented in this flame. Child of God, wouldn't it be awful if this was your loved one? If this was your sister, if this was your brother, if this was your mommy, if this was your daddy, if this was your child, wouldn't it be awful in the caverns of the doomed and damned child of God that this cry would ascend, I'm tormented. I, I'm telling you, child of God, listen out. And, le and learn from this lost man's cry this morning because this could be the cry of your loved one someday. Oh, listen and learn. Listen and learn from a lost man's cry. You learn something that you never learn in a college. And you'll learn something that you'll never learn anywhere else, not even in church. You'll learn something that you'll never learn anywhere else. Oh, child of God, listen and learn to the lost man's cry. It's real. I'll tell you, it's eternal. It's never ending. But listen not only to the lost man's cry. Listen and learn from the lost man's concern. Oh, I listen and learn from that one now. Look what we read there in verse 27. Then he said, I, I pray thee therefore, Father, Boys, I'm telling you, he believed in prayer, this fellow, when he's in hell. There's a pile of boys in hell now, and they're believing in prayer. I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for of five brethren I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place in torment. I'm telling you, there's concern in hell. You know the tragedy is, child of God, there's more concern in hell than there is in church. In hell, he remembers. Oh, listen, you unsaved people this morning. In hell, you'll bring your memories with you. In hell, you'll remember. 
You remember in hell the mornings you sat in this meeting and you sat in this church and you heard time and time again of the one that could have saved you. Ah, oh, but you laughed at it. Oh, you remember the times when I warned you from this pulpit and others and, and others who have warned you from it as well. And you remember all those times. Ah, oh, them boys don't know what they're talking about. You'll realize, friend, when it's too late, the boys knew what they were talking about. Uh, listen to them now, listen to them. I can hear his cry, but I can hear his concern. Have five brethren. Friend, he wasn't concerned now about himself. He was concerned about the five brethren. Tell me something are you concerned? I trust you are. Concerned. Have five brethren. Have five brethren. Send them that he may testify to them that they may repent lest they come to this place of torment. I'll tell you one thing about this man. There's a lot of learn there's a lot of things I have learned this week concerning his concern. And I'll tell you what one of them was. And I've never seen this before. He knew he knew he could depend on Lazarus to tell his five brethren the truth. Send Lazarus. Send them to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them. As I listen to the rich man's, this man lost soul's concern this morning, I learn about Lazarus here. The rich man could depend on him. The lost man could depend on him on going and telling his five brethren the truth. I wonder how many people in hell could, could, could count on you and me. I can almost see... Listen... We picture Lazarus this morning sitting with a bag and bowl at the rich man's gate. Well, that's where he was. And all he does is sitting there begging. I don't believe all he done was sitting beg. Every time the rich man went past the gate, I believe he testified to the rich man. I believe he did, you know. He come through the gate one day I can almost see Lazarus saying to him, Riches profit not in the day of wrath. Maybe another day the rich man came out with his dinner plate and he scraped the scraps into the rich man's bowl, or, the, or Lazarus's bowl. And old Lazarus looked up and said, he looks into the bowl, and he looks up into the face of the rich man and says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world? Loses his own soul. Maybe he's coming through the gate or going out through it in his big chariot and the big fancy horses. And Lazarus shouts after him, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to go into the kingdom of heaven. Oh, I believe Lazarus testified well. And the rich lost man now remembers this. Lazarus's words now haunt him. And the lost man's concern teaches me Lazarus was faithful in life in his witness. Can I ask you all this morning? Are you doing your best to bring 
sinners, lost souls, under the sound of the gospel? Are you concerned like Lazarus? Are you faithful like Lazarus? Warning them to flee from the wrath that's coming. Oh, dear child of God, this man's concern teaches me lessons about Lazarus I never saw before. And I'll tell you, there was one word that Lazarus must have used at the gate, and it was the word repent. Every time he went past him, he says, Hey, sir, you need to repent or you'll perish. Because when I listen to the rich man's concern, listen to what he says here. He uses the word repent. Send them. Send them to my father's house. Maybe the words, maybe the texts, maybe the wee sermons that he preached at me would bring them to repentance. Child of God, listen to this man's concern. I know he's concerned about the five brethren, but I'll tell you, it paints a lovely picture of Lazarus. A man faithful in his witness. A man concerned about the dying. A man concerned about the perishing. Are we concerned? Am I concerned? Remember Proverbs 11 and 30. He that winneth souls is wise. Lazarus Maiden had much in life. He was wise. You know, a man went to Pastor Willie Mullen one time and says, Pastor, will you come and talk to my father? He's dead. Pastor Mullen says, what are you coming run to me now for? You've been a member of this church for 16 years, I think it was, and I haven't seen you at a prayer meeting yet. Are you telling me you're concerned now for him? Will you come, Mr. Mullen? Will you come? He's dying. He says, what? Oh, come, Mr. Mullen. Say something to him. You tell me you're concerned when I've never seen you at a prayer meeting. You tell me you're concerned. Pastor Mullen went on the way. And in his dying moments, he led him to the Lord. Ah, oh, child of God, are you really concerned this morning? Let's be honest. Aye. Are we really concerned? Listen and learn this morning from the lost man's cry. Listen and learn from the lost man's concern. Finally, finally, listen and learn from to the lost man's correction. Listen and learn. Learn how he was corrected. Verse 30, and he says, Nay, Father Abram, but if one went from the dead, they will repent. <coughs> ah, but he said unto him, If they hear not Moses, neither the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. He's crying now, Listen, Lazarus, listen, Abraham, will you send Lazarus? They might listen if he, the five boys that, that were at the funeral. In fact, it was the five brethren that carried him. Maybe if they go back from the dead, they'd repent. No, no, Abram said, no, no. Ah, oh, they wouldn't even repent, even though one rose from the dead. Ah, 
and of Moses and the prophets. Everybody's looking for signs, aren't they? Maybe if we get a wee sign, maybe they'll believe. Oh, no. Imagine, imagine my great, great, great grandmother came to me some night and out of the, out of the blue. And she sat down beside me and she said something and she just disappeared again. And I went to Tracy and I told Tracy, you'll never guess what happened. You know what Tracy would tell you? You've been about a hundred cloud too long, George. Oh, no. Of Moses and the prophets. Do you know who Moses and the prophets are? In today's language, you and me. We are the ones responsible, child of God, to warn the perishing. You and I are the ones who are the Moseses and the prophets who warn those who are without a Savior, O child of God. Awesome is our responsibility. Awesome. Somebody was faithful to you. Never forget that. Derek Lone was faithful to me, and I won't forget him for it. He worked hard, and he never gave up in spite of my mocking and in spite of my hardness. Dean Roland Hutchison, the late Roland Hutchison, one of the great old preachers of the Church of Ireland. He's in heaven now. He lived not too very far from where I worked. And he used to drop in the odd time and ask me how I'm getting on and where are you taking meetings this way. He told me a story one time it was actually the first funeral that he ever conducted as a clergyman. Uh, he, he, this man was a farmer. You called him Willie, and he died. He just dropped. He just died, just fell, and it was all over. No warning, no signs, no aches, no pains. Down he went. That was it. After the funeral was over, the the Dean Hutchison, well, it was the Reverend Hutchison then. He went round to see her, the wife. And he said to the wife, he said, Listen, does Willie's, does Willie's sudden death not warn you that you'd need to be right and that you'd need to be saved? Do you know what her response was? Ach, reverence, your reverence, she said. I wouldn't want to do anything that that Willie didn't do. And Dean Hodgson, Reverend Hodgson, said to her, Listen, dear, wherever Willie is now, Willie would be praying that you'd be saved. Maybe that's a stark one when you think of it. If you have a loved one who died without Christ, left no testimony, let me tell you, my dear unsafe friend, they pray it, you'll be saved. And for those of us that are saved, let's do everything in our power to rescue them that are perishing. And may God drive this truth as we have listened and learned from the lost.